but you can explain it this way. See, helium and neon, they're just monoatomic gases. They're not bonded to anything. It's just H-E or N-E. And so when they absorb energy, they can't absorb energy vibrationally or rotationally because they don't have a bond. You have to have a bond to do vibrational or rotational energy. But they only absorb energy translationally. Oh, but look, hydrogen has a bond, H2. So it can absorb energy vibrationally, rotationally, and translationally, which means it can absorb more energy when you have the same amount of molecules. More energy for the same amount of molecules. 6.02 times 10 to the 23. Remember, that's Avogadro's number. That's what a mole is. Oh, it's beautiful. So these two are the same because they are monoatomic. And this one, because it's diatomic, has a higher molar heat capacity. Easy calculation to do. Just multiply a heat capacity, specific heat capacity, times the molar mass to get a molar heat capacity. Let's talk about the calculations associated with phase changes by drawing the warming curve for water as we take it from, let's say, minus 15 degrees Celsius, where it would be a solid, duh, all the way past 100 degrees Celsius, maybe to about 115 degrees Celsius, where it's actually going to have to undergo two phase changes at 0 degrees Celsius and 100, from solid to liquid and liquid to gas. Okay, so how does that look when we graphically represent it? Well, here we go. Warming curve for water here, where we graph temperature in degrees Celsius versus the time in seconds. You know, sometimes you're going to see reactions that we're going to put down here, uh, graphically representing them, and you're going to see the re word reaction coordinate. And that's because some reactions occur so instantaneously, we probably just don't even measure the time of them. But this one's nice and slow, so we'll put time in seconds here. Okay, so water is going to warm up from minus 15 to 0. It's also going to go from 0 to 100, and then past 100 as we continue to warm it. But at 0 and 100, there is not going to be any change in temperature as the water undergoes a phase change. Now that's very important and very significant. So what's happening from minus 15 to 0 degrees Celsius? Well, you've got solid water and the bonds, the hydrogen bonds in between water molecules, that's from junior chemistry too, right? The hydrogen bonds are quite significant, keeping that in the solid phase. But as you warm those molecules up, and they start to vibrate more, we're getting an elevation in temperature from minus 15 to zero. Increased movement means increased kinetic energy, and kinetic energy is proportional to temperature and temperature change. So when you've got increase in temperature, that's an increase in kinetic energy. Decrease in temperature, decrease in kinetic energy. So here we're going from minus 15 to zero, we're going up this way, and so we've got an increase in EK, in energie kinetique. Uh, you know, and most significantly, of course, in this one, vibrational energy as the kinetic energy. But there is no change in kinetic energy here at zero. There can't be, because if there's a kinetic energy change, there's always a temperature change. If there's no temperature change at zero, can an ice cube melt and absorb energy? Well, it has to. So then how is that energy going to be absorbed into that molecule? Well, it's the energy that is applied to melt the ice cube in this case. Who knows what the heat source is here? But, well, you have ice bonded together very strongly, and as you add that energy, the hydrogen bonds start to break, and that's breaking the intermolecular bonds, right? The bonds between the molecules. And that must be then potential energy. So when there is no change in energy, temperature, when there's no change in temperature, but there is a change in the state, you've got a change in the EP, Energie Potentielle, right? But in this case, since we're actually melting the ice and we're going this way, then it's an increase in potential energy. So of course you realize that as we go from 0 to 100, that's an increase in kinetic. And as we go here at zero at 100 degrees Celsius, from water as a liquid to water as a gas, it's absorbing energy again, 
the water molecules are to liberate themselves from the liquid state to the gaseous. In this portion here, the molecules had good rotational and vibrational energies as they were warming up in the liquid phase. Now we're breaking the bonds between the molecules here with an increase in potential energy. And then, of course, what's happening here? You've got molecules that have been liberated from the liquid phase and they're bouncing around like crazy with vibrational, rotational, and translational energies. And that is a gain in kinetic energy as we have a temperature change past 100 degrees Celsius. By the way, if we're talking about water here, now we've got water vapor there. Well, what happens if you take the water vapor and you add energy to it? Now we're probably going to be able to do what? Break the bonds in between the water molecules, and that's disturbing not the inter, but the intramolecular bonds. That's not a phase change anymore. That's a chemical change. It comes later. Now, here's something that's very important. There's a formula that's associated with kinetic energy and potential energy changes. Kinetic energy changes are proportional to temperature change, and so EK, or the amount of heat, let's say, energy, that is absorbed in any one of these changes here can be calculated by taking the mass of the chemical times the specific heat capacity of the chemical, abbreviated C, times the temperature change of the chemical. So if this was actually about 10 grams of ice, just a little chunk of ice that we were melting, we put 10 grams in there, the heat capacity there, 4.19 joules per gram degree Celsius, and the temperature change here from 0 to 100, that would get us a calculation for the amount of heat that's absorbed by the ice. We'll do that. We'll do questions like that coming up right now. But the heat that is involved in a phase change is different. The heat that's involved there you take the number of moles and you multiply it by a number that we give you called the molar heat of that phase change. This would be, the big H here would be called the molar heat of vaporization. Over here, the molar heat of, well, it's actually turning from a solid to liquid, so it's a molar heat of melting. There's another word for that, fusion, F-U-S-I-O-N, molar heat of fusion. So fusion melting, the same thing for right now. So these two formulae right here, you use those and you will be able to do any number of, of calculations in this unit. Now, I'll give you some of the important numbers of, uh, that get plugged into here coming up right now.